Chapter Eight of An Old Fashioned Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Old Fashioned Girl by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Eight Six Years Afterward. What do you think Polly is going to do this winter? exclaimed fanny looking up from the letter she had been eagerly reading going to deliver lectures on woman's rights said the young gentleman who was carefully examining his luxuriant crop of decidedly auburn hair as he lounged with both elbows on the chimney-piece going to set her cap for some young minister and marry him in the spring added mrs shaw whose mind ran a good deal upon matchmaking just now i think she is going to stay at home and do all the work cause servants cost so much it would be just like her observed maud who could pronounce the letter r now it's my opinion she is going to open a school or something of that sort to help those brothers of hers along said mr shaw who had put down his paper at the sound of polly's name every one of you wrong though papa comes nearest the truth cried fanny she's going to give music lessons and support herself so that will may go to college he is the studious one and polly is very proud of him ned the other brother has a business talent and don't care for books so he has gone out west and will make his own way anywhere polly says she isn't needed at home now the family is so small and kitty can take her place nicely so she is actually going to earn her own living and hand over her share of the family income to will what a martyr that girl does make of herself and fanny looked as solemn as if polly had proposed some awful self-sacrifice she is a sensible brave-hearted girl and i respect her for doing it said mr shaw emphatically one never knows what may happen and it does no harm for young people to learn to be independent if she is as pretty as she was last time i saw her she'll get pupils fast enough i wouldn't mind taking lessons myself was the gracious observation of shaw jr as he turned from the mirror with the soothing certainty that his objectionable hair actually was growing darker she wouldn't take you at any price said fanny remembering polly's look of disappointment and disapproval when she came on her last visit and found him an unmistakable dandy you just wait and see was the placid reply if polly does carry out her plan i wish maud to take lessons of her fanny can do as she likes but it would please me very much to have one of my girls sing as polly sings it suits old people better than your opera things and mother used to enjoy it so much as he spoke mr shaw's eye turned toward the corner of the fire where grandma used to sit the easy-chair was empty now, the kind old face was gone, and nothing but a very tender memory remained. "'I'd like to learn, Papa, and Polly is a splendid teacher, I know. She's always so patient, and makes everything so pleasant. I do hope she will get scholars enough to begin right away,' said Maud. "'When is she coming?' asked mrs shaw quite willing to help polly but privately resolving that maud should be finished off by the most fashionable master in the city she doesn't say she thanks me for asking her here as usual but says she shall go right to work and had better begin with her own little room at once won't it seem strange to have polly in town and yet not with us we'll get her somehow the little room will cost something and she can stay with us just as well as not even if she does teach tell her i say so said mr shaw she won't come i know for if she undertakes to be independent she'll do it in the most thorough manner answered fanny and mrs shaw sincerely hoped she would it was all very well to patronize the little music teacher but it was not so pleasant to have her settled in the family i shall do what i can for her among my friends and i dare say she will get on very well with young pupils to begin with if she starts right puts her terms high enough and gets a few good names to give her the entree into our first families i don't doubt she will do nicely for i must say polly has the manners of a lady observed mrs shaw she's a mighty taking little body 
and I'm glad she's to be in town, though I'd like it better if she didn't bother about teaching, but just stayed here and enjoyed herself, said Tom lazily. I've no doubt she would feel highly honored to be allowed to devote her time to your amusement, but she can't afford expensive luxuries, and she don't approve of flirting, so you will have to let her go her own way and refresh herself with such glimpses of you as her engagements permit, answered Fanny in the sarcastic tone which was becoming habitual to her. You are getting to be a regular old maid, Fan, as sharp as a lemon and twice as sour, returned Tom, looking down at her with an air of calm superiority. Do be quiet, children. You know I can't bear anything like contention. Maud, give me my Shetland shawl and put a cushion at my back. As Maud obeyed her mother, with a reproving look at her erring brother and sister, a pause followed, for which everyone seemed grateful. They were sitting about the fire after dinner, and all looked as if a little sunshine would do them good. It had been a dull November day, but all of a sudden the clouds lifted, and a bright ray shot into the room. Everyone turned involuntarily to welcome it, and everyone cried out, Why, Holly! For there on the threshold stood a bright-faced girl, smiling as if there was no such thing as November weather in the world. "'You dear thing, when did you come?' cried Fanny, kissing both the blooming cheeks with real affection, while the rest hovered near, waiting for a chance. "'I came yesterday and have been getting my nest in order, but I couldn't keep away any longer, so I ran up to say, "'How do you do?' answered Polly, in the cheery voice that did one's heart good to hear. "'My Polly always brings the sunshine with her.' and Mr. Shaw held out his hands to his little friend, for she was his favorite still. It was good to see her put both arms about his neck and give him a tender kiss that said a great deal, for Grandma had died since Polly met him last, and she longed to comfort him, seeing how gray and old he had grown. If Tom had had any thoughts of following his father's example, something in Polly's manner made him change his mind and shake hands with a hearty, I'm very glad to see you, Polly, adding to himself, as he looked at the face in the modest little bonnet, prettier than ever, by Jove. There was something more than mere prettiness in Polly's face, though Tom had not learned to see it yet. The blue eyes were clear and steady, the fresh mouth frank and sweet, the white chin was a very firm one in spite of the dimple, and the smooth forehead under the little curls had a broad, benevolent arch, while all about the face were those unmistakable lines and curves which can make even a plain countenance comely, by breathing into it the beauty of a lovely character. Polly had grown up, but she had no more style now than in the days of the round hat and rough coat, for she was all in grey, like a young Quakeress, with no ornament but a blue bow at the throat and another in the hair. Yet the plain suit became her excellently, and one never thought of the dress, looking at the active figure that wore it, for the freedom of her childhood gave to Polly that good gift, health, and every movement was full of the vigor, grace, and ease which nothing else can so surely bestow. A happy soul in a healthy body is a rare sight these days when doctors flourish and everyone is ill, and this pleasant union was the charm which Polly possessed without knowing it. "'It does seem so good to have you here again,' said Maud cuddling polly's cold hand as she sat at her feet when she was fairly established between fanny and mr shaw while tom leaned on the back of his mother's chair and enjoyed the prospect how do you get on when do you begin where's your nest now tell all about it began fanny who was full of curiosity about the new plan i shall get on very well i think for i've got twelve scholars to begin with all able to pay a good price, and I shall give my first lesson on Monday. Don't you dread it? asked Fanny. Not much. Why should I? answered Polly, stoutly. Well, I don't know. It's a new thing and must be a little bit hard at first, stammered Fanny, not liking to say that working for one's living seemed a dreadful hardship to her. 
"'It will be tiresome, of course, but I shall get used to it. "'I shall like the exercise, and the new people and places I must see will amuse me. "'Then the independence will be delightful, "'and if I can save a little to help Kitty along with, that will be best of all.' Polly's face shone as if the prospect was full of pleasure instead of work, and the hearty good will with which she undertook the new task seemed to dignify her humble hopes and plans and make them interesting in the sight of others. "'Who have you got for pupils?' asked Mrs. Shaw, forgetting her nerves for a minute. Polly named her list and took a secret satisfaction in seeing the impression which certain names made upon her hearers how in the world did you get the davenports and the greys my dear said mrs shaw sitting erect in her surprise mrs davenport and mother are relations you know you never told us that before the davenports have been away some years and i forgot all about them but when i was making my plan i knew i must have a good name or two to set me going so i just wrote and asked mrs d if she would help me she came and saw us and was very kind and has got these pupils for me like a dear good woman as she is where did you learn so much worldly wisdom polly asked mr shaw as his wife fell back in her chair and took out her salts as if this discovery had been too much for her i learnt it here sir answered polly laughing i used to think patronage and things of that sort very disagreeable and not worth having but i've got wiser and to a certain extent i'm glad to use whatever advantages i have in my power if they can be honestly got why didn't you let us help you in the beginning we should have been very glad to i'm sure put in mrs shaw who quite burned to be known as a joint patroness with mrs davenport i know you would but you have all been so kind to me i didn't want to trouble you with my little plans till the first steps were taken "'Besides, I didn't know as you would like to recommend me as a teacher, "'though you like me well enough as plain Polly.' "'My dear, of course I would, and we want you to take Maud at once, "'and teach her your sweet songs. "'She has a fine voice and is really suffering for a teacher.' "'A slight smile passed over Polly's face "'as she returned her thanks for the new pupil, "'for she remembered a time when Mrs. Shaw considered her sweet songs "'quite unfit for a fashionable young lady's repertoire. "'Where is your room?' asked Maud. "'My old friend Miss Mills has taken me in, and I'm nicely settled. "'Mother didn't like the idea of my going to a strange boarding-house, "'so Miss Mills kindly made a place for me. "'You know, she lets her rooms without board, "'but she's going to give me my dinners, "'and I'm to get my own breakfast and tea, quite independently.' i like that way and it's very little trouble my habits are so simple a bowl of bread and milk night and morning with baked apples or something of that sort is all i want and i can have it when i like is your room comfortably furnished can't we lend you anything my dear an easy chair now or a little couch so necessary when one comes in tired said mrs shaw taking unusual interest in the affair thank you but i don't need anything for I brought all sorts of home comforts with me. Oh, Fan, you ought to have seen my triumphal entry into the city, sitting among my goods and chattels in a farmer's cart. <laughs> Polly's laugh was so infectious that everyone smiled and forgot to be shocked at her performance. Yes, she added. I kept wishing I could meet you, just to see your horrified face when you saw me sitting on my little sofa, with boxes and bundles all round me, a birdcage on one side, a fishing basket with a kitten's head popping in and out of the hole on the other side, and jolly old Mr. Brown in his blue frock perched on a keg of apples in front. <laughs> it was a lovely bright day, and I enjoyed the ride immensely, for we had all sorts of adventures. Oh, tell about it begged Maud, when the general laugh at Polly's picture had subsided. Well, in the first place, we forgot my ivy, and Kitty came running after me with it. Then we started again, but were soon stopped by a great shouting, and there was Will, racing down the hill, waving a pillow in one hand and a squash pie in the other. How we did laugh when he came up and explained that our neighbor, old Mrs. Dodd, had sent in a hot pillow for me, in case of headache, and a pie to begin housekeeping with. She seemed so disappointed at being too late that Will promised to get them to me if he ran all the way to town. 
the pillow was easily disposed of, but that pie! I do believe it was stowed in every part of the wagon, and never stayed anywhere. I found it in my lap, then on the floor, next upside down among the books, then just on the point of coasting off a trunk into the road, and at last it landed in my rocking chair. Such a remarkable pie as it was, too, for in spite of all its wanderings it never got split or broken, and we finally ate it for lunch, in order to be left in peace. Next, my kitty got away, and I had a chase over walls and brooks before I got her, while Mr. Brown sat shaking with fun to see me run. We finished off by having the bookshelves tumble on our heads as we went down a hill, and losing my chair off behind as we went up a hill. A shout made us pause, and looking back, there was the poor little chair rocking all by itself in the middle of the road, while a small boy sat on the fence and whooped. <laughs> it was great fun, I do assure you. Polly had run on in her lively way, not because she thought her adventures amounted to much, but from a wish to cheer up her friends, who had struck her as looking rather dull and out of sorts, especially Mr. Shaw, and when she saw him lean back in his chair with the old hearty laugh, she was satisfied, and blessed the unlucky pie for amusing him. "'Oh, Polly, you do tell such interesting things,' sighed Maud, wiping her eyes. "'I wish I'd met you. I'd have given you three cheers and a tiger, for it must have been an imposing spectacle,' said Tom. "'No, you wouldn't. You'd have whisked round the corner when you saw me coming, or have stared straight before you, utterly unconscious of the young woman in the baggage wagon.' Polly laughed in his face just as she used to do when she said that, and in spite of the doubt cast upon his courtesy, Tom rather liked it, though he had nothing to say for himself but a reproachful. "'Now, Polly, that's too bad.' "'True, nevertheless. You must come and see my pets, Maud, for my cat and bird live together as happily as brother and sister,' said Polly, turning to Maud, who devoured every word she said. "'That's not saying much for them,' muttered Tom, feeling that Polly ought to address more of her conversation to him. "'Polly knows what she's talking about. Her brothers appreciate their sisters,' observed Fanny in her sharp tone. "'And Polly appreciates her brothers. Don't forget to add that, ma'am,' answered Tom. "'Did I tell you that Will was going to college?' broke in Polly, to avert the rising storm. "'Hope he'll enjoy himself.' observed tom with the air of a man who had passed through all the mysteries and reached that state of sublime indifference which juniors seem to pride themselves upon i think he will he's so fond of study and is so anxious to improve every opportunity i only hope you won't overwork and get sick as so many boys do said simple polly with such a respectful belief in the eager thirst for knowledge of collegians as a class that tom regarded the deluded girl with a smile of lofty pity from the heights of his vast and varied experience guess he won't hurt himself i'll see that he don't study too hard and tom's eyes twinkled as they used to do when he planned his boyish pranks i'm afraid you can't be trusted as a guide if various rumors i've heard are true said polly looking up at him with a wistful expression that caused his face to assume the sobriety of an owl's base landers i'm as steady as a clock an ornament to my class and a model young man ain't i mother and tom patted her thin cheek with a caressing hand sure of one firm friend in her for when he ceased to be a harem scarum boy, Mrs. Shaw began to take great pride in her son, and he, missing Grandma, tried to fill her place with his feeble mother. "'Yes, dear, you are all I could ask.' And Mrs. Shaw looked up at him with such affection and confidence in her eyes that Polly gave Tom the first approving look she had vouchsafed him since she came why tom should look troubled and turn grave all at once she couldn't understand but she liked to see him stroke his mother's cheek so softly as he stood with his head resting on the high back of her chair for polly fancied that he felt a man's pity for her weakness and was learning a son's patient love for a mother who had had much to bear with him 
I'm so glad you are going to be here all winter, for we are to be very gay, and I shall enjoy taking you round with me, began Fanny, forgetting Polly's plan for a moment. Polly shook her head decidedly. It sounds very nice, but it can't be done, Fan, for I've come to work, not play, to save, not spend, and parties will be quite out of the question for me. You don't intend to work all the time without a bit of fun, I hope, cried Fanny, dismayed at the idea. I mean to do what I've undertaken, and not to be tempted away from my purpose by anything. I shouldn't be fit to give lessons if I was up late, should I? And how far would my earnings go towards dress, carriages, and all the little expenses which would come if I set up for a young lady in society? I can't do both, and I'm not going to try. But I can pick up bits of fun as I go along, and be contented with free concerts and lectures, seeing you pretty often, and every Sunday Will is to spend with me, so I shall have quite as much dissipation as is good for me. If you don't come to my parties, I'll never forgive you said fanny as polly paused while tom chuckled inwardly at the idea of calling visits from a brother dissipation any small party where it will do to wear a plain black silk i can come to but the big ones mustn't be thought of thank you it was charming to see the resolution of polly's face when she said that for she knew her weakness and beyond that black silk she had determined not to go fanny said no more for she felt quite sure that Polly would relent when the time came, and she planned to give her a pretty dress for a Christmas present, so that one excuse should be removed. I say, Polly, won't you give some of us fellows music lessons? Somebody wants me to play, and I'd rather learn of you than any Signor Twanky Dillo, said Tom, who didn't find the conversation interesting. Oh, yes, if any of you boys want to learn and will behave yourselves, I'll take you but I shall charge extra, answered Polly, with a wicked sparkle of the eye, though her face was quite sober and her tone delightfully businesslike. Why, Polly, Tom isn't a boy. He's twenty, and he says I must treat him with respect. Besides, he's engaged and does put on such airs, broke in Maud, who regarded her brother as a venerable being. Who is the little girl? asked Polly, taking the news as a joke tricks why didn't you know it answered maud as if it had been an event of national importance no is it true fan and polly turned to her friend with a face full of surprise while tom struck an imposing attitude and affected absence of mind i forgot to tell you in my last letter it's just out and we don't like it very well observed fanny who would have preferred to be engaged first herself it's a very nice thing and i am perfectly satisfied announced mrs shaw rousing from a slight doze polly looks as if she didn't believe it haven't i the appearance of the happiest man alive asked tom wondering if it could be pity which he saw in the steady eyes fixed on him no i don't think you have she said slowly how the deuce should a man look then cried tom rather nettled at her sober reception of the grand news as if he had learned to care for some one a great deal more than for himself answered polly with sudden colour in her cheeks and a sudden softening of the voice as her eyes turned away from tom who was the picture of a complacent dandy from the topmost curl of his auburn head to the tips of his aristocratic boots tommy's quenched i agree with you polly i never liked tricks and i hope it's only a boy and girl fancy that will soon die a natural death said mr shaw who seemed to find it difficult to help falling into a brown study in spite of the lively chatter going on about him shaw jr being highly incensed at the disrespectful manner in which his engagement was treated tried to assume a superb air of indifference and finding that a decided failure was about to stroll out of the room with a comprehensive nod when his mother called after him where are you going dear to see tricks of course good-bye polly 
and mr thomas departed hoping that by the skilful change of tone from ardent impatience to condescending coolness he had impressed one hearer at least with the fact that he regarded trix as the star of his existence and polly as a presuming little chit if he could have heard her laugh and fanny's remarks his wrath would have boiled over fortunately he was spared the trial and went away hoping that the coquetries of his tricks would make him forget polly's look when she answered his question my dear that boy is the most deluded creature you ever saw began fanny as soon as the front door banged bell and Trix both tried to catch him and the slyest got him for in spite of his airs he is as soft-hearted as a baby you see Trix has broken off two engagements already and the third time she got jilted herself such a fuss as she made i declare it really was absurd but i do think she felt it very much for she wouldn't go out at all and got thin and pale and blue and was really quite touching i pitied her and had her here a good deal and tom took her part he always does stand up for the crushed ones and that's good of him i allow well she did the forsaken very prettily let tom amuse her and led him on till the poor fellow lost his wits and finding her crying one day about her hat which wasn't becoming he thought she was mourning for mr banks and so to comfort her the goose proposed that was all she wanted she snapped him up at once and there he is in a nice scrape for since her engagement she is as gay as ever flirts awfully with any one who comes along and keeps tom in a fume all the time i really don't think he cares for her half as much as he makes believe but he'll stand by her through thick and thin rather than do as banks did poor tom was all polly said when fan had poured the story into her ear as they sat whispering in the sofa corner my only consolation is that trix will break off the affair before spring she always does so that she may be free for the summer campaign it won't hurt tom but i hate to have him make a fool of himself out of pity for he is more of a man than he seems and i don't want any one to plague him no one but yourself said polly smiling well that's all fair he is a torment sometimes but i'm rather fond of him in spite of it i get so tired of the other fellows they are such absurd things and when tom is in his good mood he is very nice and quite refreshing i'm glad to hear it said polly making a mental note of the fact yes and when grandma was ill he was perfectly devoted i didn't know the boy had so much gentleness in him he took her death sadly to heart, for though he didn't say much, he was very grave and steady for a long time. I tried to comfort him, and we had two or three real sweet little talks together and seemed to get acquainted for the first time. It was very nice, but it didn't last. Good times never do with us. We soon got back into the old way, and now we hector one another just as before. Fanny sighed, then yawned, and fell into her usual listless attitude, as if the brief excitement of Polly's coming had begun to subside walk home with me and see my funny little room it's bright now and the air will do you good come both of you and have a frolic as we used to said polly for the red sunset now burning in the west seemed to invite them out they agreed and soon the three were walking briskly away to polly's new home in a quiet street where a few old trees rustled in the summer and the morning sun shone pleasantly in winter time the way into my parlor is up a winding stair sang polly running up two flights of broad old-fashioned steps and opening the door of a back room out of which streamed the welcome glow of firelight these are my pets maud she added pausing on the threshold and beckoning the girls to look in quietly on the rug luxuriously basking in the warmth lay a gray kitten and close by meditatively roosting on one leg stood a plump canary who cocked his bright eye at the newcomers gave a loud chirp as if to wake his comrade and then flew straight to polly's shoulder where he broke into a joyful song to welcome his mistress home allow me to introduce my family said polly this noisy little chap the boy's name nicodemus and this dozy cat is called ash puddle because the joy of her life is to get among the cinders now take off your things and let me do the honours for you are to stop to tea and the carriage is to come for you at eight i arranged it with your mother while you were upstairs i want to see everything said maud when the hats were off and the hands warmed so you shall for i think my housekeeping arrangements will amuse you then polly showed her kingdom and the three had a merry time over it the big piano took up so much room there was no place for a bed 
but polly proudly displayed the resources of her chintz-covered couch for the back let down the seat lifted up and inside were all the pillows and blankets so convenient you see and yet out of the way in the daytime for two or three of my pupils come to me explained polly then there was a bright drugget over the faded carpet the little rocking-chair and sewing-table stood at one window the ivy ran all over the other and hid the banqueting performances which went on in that corner bookshelves hung over the sofa a picture or two on the walls and a great vase of autumn leaves and grasses beautified the low chimney-piece it was a very humble little room but polly had done her best to make it pleasant and it already had a homelike look with the cheery fire and the household pets chirping and purring confidingly on the rug how nice it is exclaimed maud as she emerged from the big closet where polly kept her stores such a cunning tea-kettle and saucepan and a tate a tate set and lots of good things to eat do have toast for tea polly and let me make it with the new toasting fork it's such fun to play cook fanny was not so enthusiastic as her sister for her eyes saw many traces of what seemed like poverty to her but polly was so gay so satisfied with her small establishment so full of happy hopes and plans that her friend had not the heart to find a fault or suggest an improvement and sat where she was told laughing and talking while the others got tea this will be a country supper girls said polly bustling about here is real cream brown bread homemade cake and honey from my own beehives mother fitted me out with such a supply i'm glad to have a party for i can't eat it all quick enough butter the toast maudie and put that little cover over it tell me when the kettle boils and don't step on nicodemus whatever you do what a capital housekeeper you will make some day said fanny as she watched polly spread her table with a neatness and despatch which was pleasant to behold <laughs> yes it's good practice laughed polly filling her tiny teapot and taking her place behind the tray with a matronly air which was the best joke of the whole this is the most delicious party i ever went to observed maud with her mouth full of honey when the feast was well under way i do wish i could have a nice room like this and a cat and a bird that wouldn't eat each other up and a dear little tea-kettle and make just as much toast as i like such a peal of laughter greeted maud's pensive aspiration that miss mills smiled over her solitary cup of tea and little nick burst into a perfect ecstasy of song as he sat on the sugar-bowl helping himself i don't care for the toast and the kettle but i do envy you your good spirits polly said fanny as the merriment subsided i'm so tired of everybody and everything it seems sometimes as if i should die of ennui don't you ever feel so things worry me sometimes but i just catch up a broom and sweep or wash hard or walk or go at something with all my might and i usually find that by the time i get through the worry is gone or i've got courage enough to bear it without grumbling answered polly cutting the brown loaf energetically i can't do those things you know there's no need of it and i don't think they'd cure my worrying said fanny languidly feeding ashpuddle who sat decorously beside her at the table winking at the cream-pot a little poverty would do you good fan just enough necessity to keep you busy till you find how good work is and when you once learn that you won't complain of ennui any more returned polly who had taken kindly the hard lesson which twenty years of cheerful poverty had taught her mercy no i should hate that but i wish some one would invent a new amusement for rich people i'm dead sick of parties and flirtations trying to outdress my neighbors and going the same round year after year like a squirrel in a cage fanny's tone was bitter as well as discontented her face sad as well as listless and polly had an instinctive feeling that some trouble more real than any she had ever known before was lying heavy at her friend's heart that was not the time to speak of it but polly resolved to stand ready to offer sympathy if nothing more whenever the confidential minute came 
and her manner was so kind so comfortable that fanny felt its silent magic grew more cheerful in the quiet atmosphere of that little room and when they said good-night after an old-time gossip by the fire she kissed her hostess warmly saying with a grateful look polly dear i shall come often you do me so much good End of chapter eight chapter nine of an old-fashioned girl this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org an old-fashioned girl by louisa may alcott chapter nine lessons the first few weeks were hard ones for polly had not yet outgrown her natural shyness and going among so many strangers caused her frequent panics but her purpose gave her courage and when the ice was once broken her little pupils quickly learned to love her the novelty soon wore off and though she thought she was prepared for drudgery she found it very tedious to go on doing the same thing day after day then she was lonely for will could only come once a week her leisure hours were fanny's busiest and the bits of pleasure were so few and far between that they only tantalized her even her small housekeeping lost its charms for polly was a social creature and the solitary meals were often sad ones ashpuddle and nick did their best to cheer her but they too seemed to pine for country freedom and home atmosphere poor puddle after gazing wistfully out of the window at the gaunt city cat skulking about the yard would retire to the rug and curl herself up as if all hope of finding congenial society had failed while little nick would sing till he vibrated on his perch without receiving any response except an inquisitive chirp from the pert sparrows who seemed to twit him with his captivity yes by the time the little tea-kettle had lost its brightness polly had decided that getting one's living was no joke and many of her brilliant hopes had shared the fate of the little kettle if one could only make the sacrifice all at once and done with it then it would seem easier but to keep up a daily sacrifice of one's wishes tastes and pleasures is rather a hard task especially when one is pretty young and gay lessons all day a highly instructive lecture books over a solitary fire or music with no audience but a sleepy cat and a bird with his head tucked under his wing for evening entertainment was not exactly what might be called festive so in spite of her brave resolutions polly did long for a little fun sometimes and after saying virtuously to herself at nine yes it is much wiser and better for me to go to bed early and be ready for work to-morrow she would lie awake hearing the carriages roll to and fro and imagining the gay girls inside going to party opera or play till mrs dodd's hot pillow might as well have been stuffed with nettles for any sleep it brought or any use it was except to catch and hide the tears that dropped on it when polly's heart was very full another thorn that wounded our polly in her first attempt to make her way through the thicket that always bars a woman's progress was the discovery that working for a living shuts a good many doors in one's face even in democratic america as fanny's guest she had been in spite of poverty kindly received wherever her friend took her both as child and woman now things were changed the kindly people patronized the careless forgot all about her and even fanny with all her affection felt that polly the music teacher would not be as welcome in many places where polly the young lady had been accepted as miss shaw's friend some of the girls still nodded amiably but never invited her to visit them others merely dropped their eyelids and went by without speaking while a good many ignored her as entirely as if she had been invisible 
these things hurt polly more than she would confess for at home every one worked and every one was respected for it she tried not to care but girls feel little slights keenly and more than once polly was severely tempted to give up her plan and run away to the safe shelter at home fanny never failed to ask her to every sort of festivity in the shaw mansion but after a few trials polly firmly declined everything but informal visits when the family were alone she soon found that even the new black silk wasn't fine enough for fanny's smallest party and after receiving a few of the expressive glances by which women convey their opinion of their neighbor's toilet and overhearing a joke or two about that inevitable dress and the little blackbird polly folded away the once treasured frock saying with a choke in her voice i'll wear it for will he likes it and clothes can't change his love for me i am afraid the wholesome sweetness of polly's nature was getting a little soured by these troubles but before lasting harm was done she received from an unexpected source some of the real help which teaches young people how to bear these small crosses by showing them the heavier ones they have escaped and by giving them an idea of the higher pleasures one may earn in the good old-fashioned ways that keep hearts sweet heads sane hands busy everybody has their days of misfortune like little rosamond and polly was beginning to think she had more than her share one of these ended in a way which influenced her whole life and so we will record it it began early for the hard-hearted little grate wouldn't behave itself till she had used up a ruinous quantity of kindlings then she scalded poor puddle by upsetting her coffee-pot and instead of a leisurely cosy meal had to hurry away uncomfortably for everything went wrong even to the coming off of both bonnet strings in the last dreadful scramble being late she of course forgot her music and hurrying back for it fell into a puddle which capped the climax of her despair such a trying morning as that was polly felt out of tune herself and all the pianos seemed to need a tuner as much as she did the pupils were unusually stupid and two of them announced that their mamma was going to take them to the south whither she was suddenly called this was a blow for they had just begun and polly hadn't the face to send in a bill for the whole quarter though her plans and calculations were sadly disturbed by the failure of that sum trudging home to dinner tired and disappointed poor polly received another blow which hurt her more than the loss of all her pupils as she went hurrying along with a big music-book in one hand and a paper bag of rolls for tea in the other she saw tom and trix coming as she watched them while they slowly approached looking so gay and handsome and happy it seemed to polly as if all the sunshine and good walking was on their side of the street all the wintry wind and mud on hers longing to see a friendly face and receive a kind word she crossed over meaning to nod and smile at least trix saw her first and suddenly became absorbed in the distant horizon tom apparently did not see her for his eyes were fixed on a fine horse just prancing by polly thought that he had seen her and approached with a curious little flutter at her heart for if tom cut her she felt that her cup would be full on they came trix intent on the view tom staring at the handsome horse and polly with red cheeks expectant eyes and the brown bundle in full sight one dreadful minute as they came parallel and no one spoke or bowed then it was all over and polly went on feeling as if someone had slapped her in the face she wouldn't have believed it of tom it was all the doings of that horrid trix well she wouldn't trouble him any more if he was such a snob as to be ashamed of her just because she carried bundles and worked for her bread she clutched the paper bag fiercely as she said this to herself then her eyes filled and her lips trembled as she added how could he do it 
before her, too. Now Tom was quite guiltless of this offense, and had always nodded to Polly when they met, but it so happened he had always been alone till now, and that was why it cut so deeply, especially as Polly never had approved of tricks. Before she could clear her eyes or steady her face, a gentleman met her, lifted his hat, smiled, and said pleasantly, "'Good morning, Miss Polly. I'm glad to meet you.' Then, with a sudden change of voice and manner, he added, "'I beg pardon. Is there anything the matter? Can I be of service?' It was very awkward, but it couldn't be helped, and all Polly could do was to tell the truth and make the best of it. "'It's very silly, but it hurts me to be cut by my old friends. I shall get used to it presently, I dare say.' Mr. Sidney glanced back, recognized the couple behind them, and turned round with a disgusted expression. Polly was fumbling for her handkerchief, and without a word he took both book and bundle from her, a little bit of kindness that meant a good deal just then. Polly felt it, and it did her good. Hastily wiping the traitorous eyes, she laughed, and said cheerfully, "'There, I'm all right again. <laughs> Thank you. Don't trouble yourself with my parcels.' "'No trouble, I assure you. And this book reminds me of what I was about to say.' "'Have you an hour to spare for my little niece? "'Her mother wants her to begin, and desired me to make the inquiry.' "'Did she, really?' "'And Polly looked up at him, as if she suspected him of inventing the whole thing out of kindness. "'Mr. Sidney smiled, and taking a note from his pocket, presented it, saying, with a reproachful look, "'Behold the proof of my truth, and never doubt again.' "'Polly begged pardon.' read the note from the little girl's mother, which was to have been left at her room if she was absent, and gave the bearer a very grateful look as she accepted this welcome addition to her pupils. Well pleased at the success of his mission, Sidney artfully led the conversation to music, and for a time Polly forgot her woes, talking enthusiastically on her favorite theme— as she reclaimed her book and bag at her own door, she said, in her honest way, "'Thank you very much for trying to make me forget my foolish little troubles.' "'Then let me say one thing more. Though appearances are against him, I don't believe Tom Shaw saw you. Miss Trix is equal to that sort of thing, but it isn't like Tom. For with all his foppery, he is a good fellow at heart.' As Mr. Sidney said this, Polly held out her hand with a hearty, "'Thank you for that.' The young man shook the little hand in the gray woolen glove, gave her exactly the same bow which he did the Honorable Mrs. Davenport, and went away, leaving Polly to walk upstairs and address Puddle with the peculiar remark, "'You are a true gentleman. So kind to say that about Tom. I'll think it so, anyway, and won't I teach Minnie in my very best style?' Puddle purred. Nick chirped approvingly, and Polly ate her dinner with a better appetite than she had expected. But at the bottom of her heart there was a sore spot still, and the afternoon lessons dragged dismally. It was dusk when she got home, and as she sat in the firelight eating her bread and milk, several tears bedewed the little rolls, and even the home honey had a bitter taste. "'Now this won't do,' she broke out all at once. "'This is silly and wicked, and can't be allowed. I'll try the old plan and put myself right by doing some little kindness to somebody. Now what shall it be? Oh, I know. Fan is going to a party tonight. I'll run up and help her dress. She likes to have me, and I enjoy seeing the pretty things. Yes, and I'll take her two or three clusters of my Daphne. It's so sweet.' Up got Polly, and taking her little posy, trotted away to the Shaws, determined to be happy and contented in spite of tricks and hard work. She found Fanny enduring torment under the hands of the hairdresser, who was doing his best to spoil her hair and distort her head with a mass of curls, braids, frizzles, and puffs, for, though I discreetly refrain from any particular description, still, judging from the present fashions, I think one may venture to predict that six years hence they would be something frightful. "'How kind of you, Polly! I was just wishing you were here to arrange my flowers. 
These lovely Daphnes will give odor to my camellias, and you were a dear to bring them. There's my dress. How do you like it? said Fanny, hardly daring to lift her eyes from under the yellow tower on her head. It's regularly splendid, but how do you ever get into it? answered Polly, surveying with girlish interest the cloud of pink and white lace that lay upon the bed. It's fearfully and wonderfully made, but distractingly becoming, as you shall see. Trix thinks I'm going to wear blue, so she has got a green one, and told Belle it would spoil the effect of mine, as we are much together, of course. Wasn't that sweet of her? Belle came and told me in time, and I just got pink, so my amiable sister, that is to be, won't succeed in her pretty little plot. I guess she has been reading the life of Josephine. You know she made a pretty lady of whom she was jealous sit beside her on a green sofa, which set off her own white dress, and spoilt the blue one of her guest, answered Polly, busy with the flowers. Trix never reads anything. You are the one to pick up clever little stories. I'll remember and use this one. Am I done? Yes, that is charming, isn't it, Polly? And Fan rose to inspect the success of Monsieur's long labor. You know I don't appreciate a stylish coiffure as I ought, so I like your hair in the old way best. But this is the thing, I suppose, and not a word must be said. Of course it is. Why, child, I have frizzed and burnt my hair so that I look like an old maniac with it in its natural state, and have to repair damages as well as I can. Now put the flowers just here. And Fanny laid a pink camellia in a nest of fuzz and stuck a spray of Daphne straight up at the back of her head. Oh, Fan, don't. It looks horridly so, cried Polly, longing to add a little beauty to her friend's sallow face by a graceful adjustment of the flowers. "'Can't help it. That's the way, and so it must be,' answered Fan, planting another sprig halfway up the tower. Polly groaned and offered no more suggestions as the work went on, but when Fanny was finished from top to toe, she admired all she honestly could and tried to keep her thoughts to herself. But her frank face betrayed her, for Fanny turned on her suddenly, saying— you may as well free your mind, Polly, for I see by your eyes that something don't suit. I was only thinking of what Grandma once said, that modesty had gone out of fashion, answered Polly, glancing at the waist of her friend's dress, which consisted of a belt, a bit of lace, and a pair of shoulder straps. Fanny laughed good-naturedly, saying, as she clasped her necklace, If I had such shoulders as yours, I shouldn't care what the fashion was. Now don't preach, but put my cloak on nicely and come along, for I'm to meet Tom and Trix and promise to be there early. Polly was to be left at home after depositing Fan at Bell's. I feel as if I was going myself, she said as they rolled along. I wish you were, and you would be, Polly, if you weren't such a resolute thing. I've teased and begged and offered anything I have if you'll only break your absurd vow and come and enjoy yourself. Thank you, but I won't, so don't trouble your kind heart about me. I'm all right, said Polly, stoutly. But when they drew up before the lighted house, and she found herself in the midst of the pleasant stir of festivity, the coming and going of carriages, the glimpses of bright colors, forms, and faces, the bursts of music, and a general atmosphere of gaiety, Polly felt that she wasn't all right, and as she drove away for a dull evening in her lonely little room, she just cried as heartily as any child denied a stick of candy. "'It's dreadful wicked of me, but I can't help it,' she sobbed to herself in the corner of the carriage. "'That music sets me all in a twitter, and I should have looked nice in Fan's blue tarlatan, and I know I could behave as well as anyone and have lots of partners, though I'm not in that set.' "'Oh, just one good gallop with Mr. Sidney or Tom. "'No, Tom wouldn't ask me there, and I wouldn't accept if he did. "'Oh, me, oh, me. "'I wish I was as old and homely and good and happy as Miss Mills.' "'So Polly made her moan, and by the time she got home "'was just in the mood to go to bed and cry herself to sleep, "'as girls have a way of doing when their small affliction becomes unbearable.' But Polly didn't get a chance to be miserable very long, for as she went upstairs, feeling like the most injured girl in the world, 
she caught a glimpse of Miss Mills sewing away with such a bright face that she couldn't resist stopping for a word or two. Sit down, my dear. I'm glad to see you, but excuse me if I go on with my work as I'm in a driving hurry to get these things done tonight, said the brisk little lady with a smile and a nod as she took a new needleful of thread and ran up a seam as if for a wager let me help you then i'm lazy and cross and it will do me good said polly sitting down with the resigned feeling well if i can't be happy i can be useful perhaps thank you my dear yes you can just hem the skirt while i put in the sleeves and that will be a great lift polly put on her thimble in silence but as miss mills spread the white flannel over her lap she exclaimed why it looks like a shroud is it one no dear thank god it isn't but it might have been if we hadn't saved the poor little soul cried miss mills with a sudden brightening of the face which made it beautiful in spite of the stiff gray curl that bobbed on each temple the want of teeth and a crooked nose will you tell me about it i like to hear your adventures and good works so much said polly ready to be amused by anything that made her forget herself. Ah, uh, my dear, it's a very common story, and that's the saddest part of it. I'll tell you all about it, for I think you may be able to help me. Last night I watched with poor Mary Floyd. She's dying of consumption, you know, began Miss Mills as her nimble fingers flew and her kind old face beamed over the work as if she put a blessing in with every stitch mary was very low but about midnight fell asleep and i was trying to keep things quiet when mrs finn she's the woman of the house came and beckoned me out with a scared face little jane has killed herself and i don't know what to do she said leading me up to the attic who was little jane broke in polly dropping her work i only knew her as a pale shy young girl who went in and out and seldom spoke to any one mrs finn told me she was poor but a busy honest little thing who didn't mix with the other folks but lived and worked alone she has looked so downhearted and pale for a week that i thought she was sick and asked her about it said mrs finn but she thanked me in her bashful way and said she was pretty well so i let her alone but tonight, as i went up late to bed i was kind of impressed to look in and see how the poor thing did for she hadn't left her room all day i did look in and here's what i found as mrs finn ended she opened the door of the back attic and i saw about as sad a sight as these old eyes ever looked at oh what cried polly pale now with interest a bare room cold as a barn and on the bed a little dead white face that almost broke my heart it was so thin so patient and so young on the table was a bottle half full of laudanum an old pocket-book and a letter read that my dear and don't think hard of little jane polly took the bit of paper miss mills gave her and read these words dear mrs finn please forgive me for the trouble i make you but i don't see any other way i can't get work that pays enough to keep me the doctor says i can't be well unless i rest i hate to be a burden so i'm going away not to trouble anybody any more i've sold my things to pay what i owe you please let me be as i am and don't let people come and look at me. I hope it isn't very wicked, but there don't seem any room for me in the world, and I'm not afraid to die now, though I should be if I stayed and got bad, because I hadn't strength to keep right. Give my love to the baby. And so, goodbye, goodbye, Jane Bryant. Oh, Miss Mills, how dreadful, cried Polly with her eyes so full she could hardly read the little letter not so dreadful as it might have been but a bitter sad thing to see that child only seventeen 
lying there in her little clean old nightgown, waiting for death to come and take her, because there didn't seem to be any room for her in the world. <sighs> well, we saved her, for it wasn't too late, thank heaven. And the first thing she said was, Oh, why did you bring me back? Huh, <sighs> I've been nursing her all day hearing her story and trying to show her that there is room and a welcome for her. Her mother died a year ago, and since then she has been struggling along alone. She is one of the timid, innocent, humble creatures who can't push their way, and so get put aside and forgotten. She has tried all sorts of poorly paid work, couldn't live on it decently, got discouraged, sick, frightened, and could see no refuge from the big, bad world but to get out of it while she wasn't afraid to die. <sighs> A very old story, my dear. New and dreadful as it seems to you. And I think it won't do you any harm to see and help this little girl, who has gone through dark places that you are never like to know. I will. Indeed, I will do all I can. Where is she now? asked Polly touched to the heart by the story so simple yet so sad there and miss mills pointed to the door of her own little bedroom she was well enough to be moved tonight, so i brought her home and laid her safely in my bed poor little soul she looked about her for a minute then the lost look went away and she gave a great sigh and took my hand in both her thin bits of ones and said Oh, ma'am, I feel as if I'd been born into a new world. Help me to begin again, and I'll do better. So I told her she was my child now, and might rest here, sure of a home as long as I had one. As Miss Mills spoke in her motherly tone, and cast a proud and happy look toward the warm and quiet nest in which she had sheltered this friendless little sparrow, feeling sure that god meant her to keep it from falling to the ground polly put both arms about her neck and kissed her withered cheek with as much loving reverence as if she had been a splendid saint for in the likeness of this plain old maid she saw the lovely charity that blesses and saves the world how good you are dear miss mills tell me what to do let me help you i am ready for anything said polly very humbly for her own troubles looked so small and foolish beside the stern hardships which had nearly had so tragical an end that she felt heartily ashamed of herself and quite burned to atone for them miss mills stopped to stroke the fresh cheek opposite to smile and say then polly i think i'll ask you to go in and say a friendly word to my little girl the sight of you will do her good and you have just the right way of comforting people without making a fuss have i said polly looking much gratified by the words yes dear you've the gift of sympathy and the rare art of showing it without offending i wouldn't let many girls in to see my poor jenny because they'd only flutter and worry her but you'll know what to do so go and take this wrapper with you it's done now, thanks to your nimble fingers. Polly threw the warm garment over her arm, feeling a thrill of gratitude that it was to wrap a living girl in, and not to hide away a young heart that had grown cold too soon. Pushing open the door, she went quietly into the dimly lighted room, and on the pillow saw a face that drew her to it with an irresistible power— for it was touched by a solemn shadow that made its youth pathetic. As she paused at the bedside, thinking the girl asleep, a pair of hollow, dark eyes opened wide and looked up at her, startled at first, then softening with pleasure at the sight of the bonny face before them, and then a humble, beseeching expression filled them, as if asking pardon for the rash act nearly committed, and pity for the hard fate that prompted it. Polly read the language of these eyes, and answered their mute prayer with a simple eloquence that said more than any words, 
for she just stooped down and kissed the poor child with her own eyes full and lips that trembled with the sympathy she could not tell jenny put both arms about her neck and began to shed the quiet tears that so refresh and comfort heavy hearts when a tender touch unseals the fountain where they lie everybody is so kind she sobbed and i was so wicked i don't deserve it oh yes you do don't think of that but rest and let us pet you the old life was too hard for such a little thing as you and we are going to try and make the new one ever so much easier and happier said polly forgetting everything except that this was a girl like herself who needed hardening up do you live here asked jenny when her tears were wiped away still clinging to the new-found friend yes miss mills lets me have a little room upstairs and there i have my cat and bird my piano and my posy pots and live like a queen you must come up and see me to-morrow if you are able i'm often lonely for there are no young people in the house to play with me answered polly smiling hospitably do you sew asked jenny no i'm a music teacher and trot round giving lessons all day how beautiful it sounds and how happy you must be so strong and pretty and able to go round making music all the time sighed jenny looking with respectful admiration at the plump firm hand held in both her thin and feeble ones it did sound pleasant even to polly's ears and she felt suddenly so rich and so contented that she seemed a different creature from the silly girl who cried because she couldn't go to the party it passed through her mind like a flash the contrast between her life and that of the wan creature lying before her and she felt as if she could not give enough out of her abundance to this needy little sister who had nothing in the wide world but the life just saved to her that minute did more for polly than many sermons or the wisest books for it brought her face to face with bitter truths showed her the dark side of life and seemed to blow away her little vanities her frivolous desires like a wintry wind that left a wholesome atmosphere behind sitting on the bedside polly listened while jane told the story which was so new to her listener that every word sank deep into her heart and never was forgotten now you must go to sleep don't cry nor think nor do anything but rest that will please miss mills best i'll leave the doors open and play you a lullaby that you can't resist good night dear and with another kiss polly went away to sit in the darkness of her own room playing her softest airs till the tired eyes below were shut and little jane seemed to float away on a sea of pleasant sounds into the happier life which had just dawned for her polly had fully intended to be very miserable and cry herself to sleep but when she lay down at last her pillow seemed very soft her little room very lovely with the firelight flickering on all the homelike objects and her new-blown roses breathing her a sweet good night she no longer felt an injured hard-working unhappy polly but as if quite burdened with blessings for which she wasn't half grateful enough she had heard of poverty and suffering in the vague far-off way which is all that many girls safe in happy homes ever know of it but now she had seen it in a shape which she could feel and understand and life grew more earnest to her from that minute so much to do in the great busy world and she had done so little where should she begin then like an answer came little jenny's words now taking a new significance to polly's mind to be strong and beautiful and go round making music all the time yes she could do that and with a very earnest prayer polly asked for the strength of an upright soul the beauty of a tender heart the power to make her life a sweet and stirring song helpful while it lasted remembered when it died little jane's last thought had been to wish with all her might that god would bless the dear kind girl up there 
and give her all she asked. I think both prayers, although too humble to be put in words, went up together, for in the fullness of time they were beautifully answered. End of chapter 9《ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ネイル・ハッピーバースデー・ノーマル・ Instead of sleeping later than usual that morning, she was always up bright and early, flying round to get ready for her guest, for Will came to breakfast, and they made a long day of it. Will considered his sister the best and prettiest girl going, and Polly, knowing well that a time would come when he would find a better and a prettier, was grateful for his good opinion and tried to deserve it. So she made her room and herself as neat and inviting as possible, and always ran to meet him with a bright face and a motherly greeting when he came tramping in, ruddy, brisk, and beaming, with the brown loaf and the little pot of beans from the bakehouse nearby. They liked a good country breakfast, and nothing gave Polly more satisfaction than to see her big boy clear the dishes, empty the little coffee pot, and then sit and laugh at her across the ravaged table. Another pleasure was to let him help clear away, as they used to do at home, while the peals of laughter that always accompanied this performance did Miss Mill's heart good to hear. For the room was so small and Will so big that he seemed to be everywhere at once, and Polly and Puddle were continually dodging his long arms and legs. Then they used to inspect the flower pots, pay Nick a visit, and have a little music as a good beginning for the day, after which they went to church and dined with Miss Mills, who considered Will an excellent young man. If the afternoon was fair, they took a long walk together over the bridges into the country or about the city streets full of Sabbath quietude. Most people meeting them would have seen only an awkward young man with a boy's face atop of his tall body and a quietly dressed, fresh faced little woman hanging on his arm. But a few people, with eyes to read romances and pleasant histories everywhere, Found something very attractive in this couple, and smiled as they passed, wondering if they were young lovers or country cousins looking round. If the day was stormy, they stayed at home, reading, writing letters, talking over their affairs, and giving each other good advice, for, though Will was nearly three years younger than Polly, he couldn't for the life of him help assuming amusingly venerable airs when he became a freshman. In the twilight he had a good lounge on the sofa, and Polly sung to him, which arrangement he particularly enjoyed. It was so cozy and homey. At nine o'clock, Polly packed his bag with clean clothes, nicely mended, such remnants of the festive tea as were transportable, and kissed him good night, with many injunctions to muffle up his throat going over the bridge, and be sure that his feet were dry and warm when he went to bed. All of which Will laughed at, accepted graciously, and didn't obey, but he liked it, and trudged away for another week's work. Rested, cheered, and strengthened by that quiet, happy day with Polly, for he had been brought up to believe in home influences, and this brother and sister loved one another dearly and were not ashamed to own it. One other person enjoyed the humble pleasures of these Sundays quite as much as Polly and Will. Maud used to beg to come to tea, and Polly, glad to do anything for those who had done a good deal for her, made a point of calling for the little girl as they came home from their walk, or sending Will to escort her in the carriage, which Maud always managed to secure if bad weather threatened to quench her hopes. Tom and Fanny laughed at her fancy, but she did not tire of it. 
for the child was lonely and found something in that little room which the great house could not give her maud was twelve now a pale plain child with sharp intelligent eyes and a busy little mind that did a good deal more thinking than anybody imagined she was just at the unattractive fidgety age when no one knew what to do with her and so let her fumble her way up as she could finding pleasure in odd things and living much alone for she did not go to school because her shoulders were growing round and mrs shaw would not allow her figure to be spoiled that suited maud excellently and whenever her father spoke of sending her again or getting a governess she was seized with bad headaches a pain in her back or weakness of the eyes at which mr shaw laughed but let her holiday go on nobody seemed to care much for plain pug-nosed little maudie her father was busy her mother nervous and sick fanny absorbed in her own affairs and tom regarded her as most young men do their younger sisters as a person born for his amusement and convenience nothing more maud admired tom with all her heart and made a little slave of herself to him feeling well repaid if he merely said thank you chicken or didn't pinch her nose or nip her ear as he had a way of doing just as if i was a doll or a dog and hadn't got any feelings she sometimes said to fanny when some service or sacrifice had been accepted without gratitude or respect it never occurred to tom when maud sat watching him with her face full of wistfulness that she wanted to be petted as much as ever he did in his neglected boyhood or that when he called her pug before people her little feelings were as deeply wounded as his used to be when the boys called him carrots he was fond of her in his fashion but he didn't take the trouble to show it so maud worshipped him afar off afraid to betray the affection that no rebuff could kill or cool one snowy sunday afternoon tom lay on the sofa in his favorite attitude reading pendennis for the fourth time and smoking like a chimney as he did so maud stood at the window watching the falling flakes with an anxious countenance and presently a great sigh broke from her don't do that again chicken or you'll blow me away what's the matter asked tom throwing down his book with a yawn that threatened dislocation i'm afraid i can't go to polly's answered maud disconsolately of course you can't it's snowing hard and father won't be home with the carriage till this evening what are you always cutting off to polly's for i like it we have such nice times and will is there and we bake little johnny cakes in the baker before the fire and they sing and it is so pleasant warbling johnny cakes must be interesting come and tell me all about it no you'll only laugh at me i give you my word i won't if i can help it but i really am dying of curiosity to know what you do down there you like to hear secrets so tell me yours and i'll be as dumb as an oyster it isn't a secret and you wouldn't care for it do you want another pillow she added as tom gave his a thump this will do but why you women always stick tassels and fringe all over a sofa cushion to tease and tickle a fellow is what i don't understand one thing that polly does sunday nights is to take will's head in her lap and smooth his forehead it rests him after studying so hard she says if you don't like the pillow i could do that for you cause you look as if you were more tired of studying than will said maud with some hesitation but an evident desire to be useful and agreeable well i don't care if you do try it for i am confoundedly tired and tom laughed as he recalled the frolic he had been on the night before maud established herself with great satisfaction and tom owned that a silk apron was nicer than a fuzzy cushion do you like it she asked after a few strokes over the hot forehead which she thought was fevered by intense application to greek and latin not bad play away 
was the gracious reply as tom shut his eyes and lay so still that maud was charmed at the success of her attempt presently she said softly tom are you asleep just turning the corner before you get quite round would you please tell me what a public admonition is what do you want to know for demanded tom opening his eyes very wide i heard will talking about publics and privates and i meant to ask him but i forgot what did he say i don't remember it was about somebody who cut prayers and got a private and had done all sorts of bad things and had one or two publics i didn't hear the name and didn't care i only wanted to know what the words meant so will tells tales does he and tom's forehead wrinkled with a frown no he didn't polly knew about it and asked him will's a dig growled tom shutting his eyes again as if nothing more could be said of the delinquent william i don't care if he is i like him very much and so does polly happy fresh said tom with a comical groan you needn't sniff at him for he is nice and treats me with respect cried maud with an energy that made tom laugh in her face he's good to polly always and puts on her cloak for her and says my dear and kisses her good night and don't think it's silly and i wish i had a brother just like him yes i do and maud showed signs of woe for her disappointment about going was very great bless my boots what's the chicken ruffling up her little feathers and pecking at me for is that the way polly soothes the best of brothers said tom still laughing oh i forgot there i won't cry but i do want to go and maud swallowed her tears and began to stroke again now tom's horse and sleigh were in the stable for he meant to drive out to college that evening but he didn't take maud's hint it was less trouble to lie still and say in a conciliatory tone tell me some more about this good boy it's very interesting no i shan't but i'll tell about puddles playing on the piano said maud anxious to efface the memory of her momentary weakness polly points to the right key with a little stick and puddles sits on the stool and pats each key as it's touched and it makes a tune it's so funny to see her and nick perches on the rack and sings as if he'd kill himself very thrilling said tom in a sleepy tone maud felt that her conversation was not as interesting as she hoped and tried again polly thinks you are handsomer than mr sidney much obliged i asked which she thought had the nicest face and she said yours was the handsomest and his the best does he ever go there asked a sharp voice behind them and looking round maud saw fanny in the big chair cooking her feet over the register i never saw him there he sent up some books one day and will teased her about it what did she do demanded fanny oh she shook him what a spectacle and tom looked as if he would have enjoyed seeing it but fanny's face grew so forbidding that tom's little dog who was approaching to welcome her put his tail between his legs and fled under the table then there isn't any sparking sunday night sung tom who appeared to have waked up again of course not polly isn't going to marry anybody she's going to keep house for will when he's a minister i heard her say so cried maud with importance what a fate for pretty polly ejaculated tom she likes it and i'm sure i should think she would it's beautiful to hear em plan it all out any more gossip to retail pug asked tom a minute after as maud seemed absorbed in visions of the future he told a funny story about blowing up one of the professors you never told us so i suppose you didn't know it some bad fellow put a torpedo or some sort of powder thing under the chair and it went off in the midst of the lesson and the poor man flew up frightened most to pieces and the boys ran with pails of water to put the fire out but the thing that made will laugh most was 
that the very fellow who did it got his trousers burnt trying to put the fire out. And he asked the, is it faculty or president? Either will do, murmured Tom, who was shaking with suppressed laughter. Well, he asked them to give him some new ones, and they did give him money enough for a nice pair, but he got some cheap ones with hard great stripes on them and always wore em to that particular class which was one too many for the fellows will said and with the rest of the money he had a punch party wasn't that dreadful awful and tom exploded into a great laugh that made fanny cover her ears and the little dog bark wildly did you know that bad boy asked innocent maud slightly gasped tom in whose wardrobe at college those identical trousers were hanging at that moment don't make such a noise my head aches dreadfully said fanny fretfully girls heads always do ache answered tom subsiding from a roar into a chuckle what pleasure you boys can find in such ungentlemanly things i don't see said fanny who was evidently out of sorts as much a mystery to you as it is to us how you girls can like to gabble and prink from one week's end to the other retorted tom there was a pause after this little passage at arms but fan wanted to be amused for time hung heavily on her hands so she asked in a more amiable tone how's tricks as sweet as ever answered tom gruffly did she scold you as usual she just did what was the matter well, I'll leave it to you if this isn't unreasonable. She won't dance with me herself, yet don't like me to go it with anybody else. I said, I thought if a fellow took a girl to a party, she ought to dance with him once, at least especially if they were engaged. She said that was the very reason why she shouldn't do it. So at the last hop, I let her alone and had a gay time with Belle. And today, Trix gave it to me hot and heavy, coming home from church. If you go and engage yourself to a girl like that, I don't know what you can expect. Did she wear her Paris hat today? Added Fan, with sudden interest in her voice. She wore some sort of a blue thing, with a confounded bird of paradise in it, that kept whisking into my face every time she turned her head. Men never know a pretty thing when they see it. That hat is perfectly lovely. They know a lady when they see her, and tricks don't look like one. I can't say where the trouble is. Well, there's too much fuss and feathers for my taste. You are twice as stylish, yet you never look loud or fast. Touched by this unusual compliment, Fanny drew her chair nearer as she replied with complacency. Yes, I flatter myself I do know how to dress well. Trix never did. She's fond of gay colors and generally looks like a walking rainbow. Can't you give her a hint? Tell her not to wear blue gloves anyway. She knows I hate em i've done my best for your sake tom but she is a perverse creature and don't mind a word i say even about things much more objectionable than blue gloves maudie run and bring me my other cigar case it's lying round somewhere maud went and as soon as the door was shut tom rose on his elbow saying in a cautiously lowered voice fan does trix paint yes and draws too answered fanny with a sly laugh come you know what i mean i've a right to ask and you ought to tell said tom soberly for he was beginning to find that being engaged was not unmitigated bliss what makes you think she does well between ourselves said tom looking a little sheepish but anxious to set his mind at rest she never will let me kiss her on her cheek nothing but an unsatisfactory peck at her lips then the other day, as I took a bit of heliotrope out of a vase to put in my buttonhole, I whisked a drop of water into her face. I was going to wipe it off, but she pushed my hand away and ran to the glass, where she carefully dabbed it dry, and came back with one cheek redder than the other. I didn't say anything, but I had my suspicions. Come now. Does she? Yes, she does, but don't say a word to her, for she'll never forgive my telling if she knew it i don't care for that i don't like it and i won't have it said tom decidedly you can't help yourself half the girls do it either paint or powder darken their lashes with burnt hairpins or take cologne on lumps of sugar or belladonna to make their eyes bright clara tried arsenic for her complexion but her mother stopped it said fanny 
betraying the secrets of the prison house in the basest manner i knew you girls were a set of humbugs and very pretty ones too some of you but i can't say i'd like to see you painted up like a lot of actresses said tom with an air of disgust i don't do anything of the sort or need it but trix does and having chosen her you must abide by your choice for better or worse it hasn't come to that yet muttered tom as he lay down again with a rebellious air maud's return put an end to these confidences though tom excited her curiosity by asking the mysterious question i say fan is polly up to that sort of thing no she thinks it's awful when she gets pale and dragged out she will probably change her mind i doubt it said tom polly says it isn't proper to talk secrets before people who ain't in em observed maud with dignity do for mercy's sake stop talking about polly i'm sick to death of it cried fanny snappishly hello and tom sat up to take a survey i thought you were bosom friends and as spoony as ever well i am fond of polly but i get tired of hearing maud sing her praises everlastingly now don't go and repeat that chatterbox my goodness isn't she cross whispered maud to tom as two sticks let her be there's the bell see who it is pug answered tom as a tingle broke the silence of the house maud went to peep over the banisters and came flying back in a rapture it's will come for me can't i go it don't snow hard and i'll bundle up and you can send for me when papa comes i don't care what you do answered fan who was in a very bad temper without waiting for any other permission maud rushed away to get ready will wouldn't come up he was so snowy and fanny was glad because with her he was bashful awkward and silent so tom went down and entertained him with maud's report they were very good friends but led entirely different lives will being a dig and tom a bird or in plain english one was a hard student and the other a jolly young gentleman tom had rather patronized will who didn't like it and showed that he didn't by refusing to borrow money of him or accept any of his invitations to join the clubs and societies to which tom belonged so shaw let milton alone and he got on very well in his own way doggedly sticking to his books and resisting all temptations but those of certain libraries athletic games and such inexpensive pleasures as were within his means for this benighted youth had not yet discovered that college nowadays is a place in which to skylark not to study when maud came down and trotted contentedly away holding will's hand tom watched them out of sight and then strolled about the house whistling and thinking till he went to sleep in his father's armchair for want of something better to do he awoke to the joys of a solitary tea for his mother never came down and fanny shut herself and her headache up in her own room well wow, this is cheerful he said as the clock struck eight and his fourth cigar came to an end trix is mad and fan in the dumps so i'll take myself off guess i'll go round to polly's and ask will to drive out with me and save him the walk poor chap might bring midget home it will please her there's no knowing when the governor will be back with these thoughts in his head tom leisurely got under way and left his horse at a neighboring stable for he meant to make a little call and see what it was maud enjoyed so much polly is holding forth he said to himself as he went quietly upstairs and the steady murmur of a pleasant voice came down to him tom laughed at polly's earnest way of talking when she was interested in anything but he liked it because it was so different from the coquettish clatter of most of the girls with whom he talked young men often laugh at the sensible girls whom they secretly respect and affect to admire the silly ones whom they secretly despise because earnestness intelligence and womanly dignity are not the fashion the door was ajar and pausing in the dark entry tom took a survey before he went in the prospect was not dazzling but homelike and pleasant 
the light of a bright fire filled the little room and down on a stool before it was maud tending puddle and watching with deep interest the roasting of an apple intended for her special benefit on the couch lounged will his thoughtful eyes fixed on polly who while she talked smoothed the broad forehead of her yellow-haired laddie in a way that tom thought an immense improvement on maud's performance they had evidently been building castles in the air for polly was saying in her most impressive manner well whatever you do well don't have a great costly church that takes so much money to build and support it that you have nothing to give away i like the plain old-fashioned churches built for use not show where people met for hearty praying and preaching and where everybody made their own music instead of listening to opera singers as we do now i don't care if the old churches were bare and cold and the seats hard there was real piety in them and the sincerity of it was felt in the lives of the people i don't want a religion that i put away with my sunday clothes and don't take out till the day comes round again i want something to see and feel and live by day by day and i hope you'll be one of the true ministers who can teach by precept and example how to get and keep it i hope i shall be polly but you know they say that in families if there is a boy who can't do anything else they make a minister of him i should think i ain't good for much and that seems to me the reason why i shouldn't even try to be a minister said will smiling yet looking as if with all his humility he did have faith in the aspirations that came to him in his best moments someone said that very thing to father once and i remember he answered i am glad to give my best and brightest son to the service of god did he say that and will's color rose for the big book-loving fellow was as sensitive as a girl to the praise of those dearest to him yes said polly unconsciously giving the strongest stimulus to her brother's hope and courage yes and he added i shall let my boys follow the guide that is in them and only ask of them to use their gifts conscientiously and be honest useful men so we will ned is doing well at west and i'm hard at it here if father does his best to give us the chance we each want the least we can do is work with a will whatever you do you can't help working with a will cried tom who had been so interested that he forgot he was playing eavesdropper polly flew up looking so pleased and surprised that tom reproached himself for not having called oftener i've come from maud he announced in a paternal tone which made that young lady open her eyes i can't go till my apple is done besides it isn't nine yet and will is going to take me along when he goes i'd rather have him i'm going to take you both in the cutter the storm is over but it is heavy walking so you'll drive out with me old man said tom with a nod at will of course he will and thank you very much i've been trying to keep him all night miss mills always manages to find a corner for stray people but he insists on going so as to get to work early to-morrow said polly delighted to see that tom was taking off his coat as if he meant to wait for maud's apple which polly blessed for being so slow to cook putting her guest into the best chair polly sat down and beamed at him with such hospitable satisfaction that tom went up several pegs in his own estimation you don't come very often so we are rather overpowered when you do honor us she said demurely well you know we fellows are so busy we haven't much time to enjoy ourselves answered tom ahem said will loudly take a troche said tom then they both burst out laughing and polly fully understanding the joke joined them saying here are some peanuts tom do enjoy yourself while you can now i call that a delicate compliment and tom who had not lost his early relish for this sort of refreshment though he seldom indulged his passion nowadays because peanuts are considered vulgar fell to cracking and munching with great satisfaction do you remember the first visit i made at your house how you gave me peanuts coming from the depot and frightened me out of my wits pretending the coachman was tipsy asked polly of course i do and how he coasted one day answered tom laughing 
"'Yes, and the velocipede. "'You've got the scar of that yet, I see.' "'I remember how you stood by me while it was sewed up. "'That was very plucky, Polly.' "'I was dreadfully afraid. "'But I remember I wanted to seem very brave "'because you'd called me a coward.' "'Did I? "'Ah, ought to have been ashamed of myself. "'I used to rough you shamefully, Polly. "'You were so good-natured you let me do it.' "'Couldn't help myself.' laughed polly i did used to think you were an awful boy but seems to me i rather liked it she got so much of it home she got used to it put in will pulling the little curl behind polly's ear you boys never teased me as tom did that's the reason it amused me i suppose novelty hath charms you know grandma used to lecture tom for plaguing you polly and he used to say he'd be a tip-top boy but he wasn't observed Maud with a venerable air. Dear old Grandma, she did her best, but I'm a bad lot, said Tom, with a shake of the head and a sober face. It always seems as if she must be up in her rooms, and I can't get used to finding them empty, added Polly softly. Father wouldn't have anything moved, and Tom sits up there sometimes. It makes him feel good, he says, said Maud who had a talent for betraying trifles which people preferred should not be mentioned in public. "'You'd better hurry up your apple, for if it isn't done pretty soon, you'll have to leave it, Pug,' said Tom, looking annoyed. "'How is Fan?' asked Polly, with tact. "'Well, Fan is rather under the weather. Says she's dyspeptic, which means cross.' "'She is cross.' but she's sick too for i found her crying one day and she said nobody cared about her and she might as well be dead added maud having turned her apple with tender care we must try to cheer her up among us if i wasn't so busy i'd like to devote myself to her she has done so much for me said polly gratefully i wish you could i can't understand her for she acts like a weathercock and i never know how i'm going to find her I hate to have her mope so, but upon my life I don't know what to do," said Tom, but as he uttered the words something was suggested by the sight before him. Chairs were few, and Polly had taken half of Will's when they drew round the fire. Now she was leaning against him, in a cosy, confiding way, delightful to behold, while Will's strong arm went round her with a protecting air which said, as plainly as any words, that this big brother and small sister knew how to love and help one another. It was a pleasant little picture, all the pleasanter for its unconsciousness, and Tom found it both suggestive and agreeable. Poor old Fan. She don't get much petting. Maybe that's what she wants. I'll try it and see, for she stands by me like a trump. If she was a rosy, cozy little woman like Polly, it would come easier, though, thought Tom, as he meditatively ate his last nut, feeling that fraternal affection could not be very difficult of demonstration to brothers blessed with pretty, good-tempered sisters. I told Tom about the bad fellow who blew up the professor, and he said he knew him slightly, and I was so relieved because I had kind of a feeling that it was Tom himself. You and Will laughed so about it. Maud had a queer way of going on with her own thoughts and suddenly coming out with whatever lay uppermost, regardless of time, place, or company. As this remark fell from her, there was a general smile, and Polly said, with mock solemnity, It was a sad thing, and I've no doubt that misguided young man is very sorry for it now. "'You look perfectly bowed down with remorse last time I saw him,' said Will, regarding Tom with eyes full of fun, for Will was a boy as well as a bookworm, and relished a joke as well as scatterbrained Tom. "'He always is remorseful after a scrape, I've understood, for he isn't a very bad fellow. Only his spirits are one too many for him, and he isn't as fond of his books as another fellow I know.' "'I'm afraid he'll be expelled if he don't mind,' said Polly, warningly. "'Shouldn't wonder if he was. He's such an unlucky dog,' answered Tom, rather soberly. "'I hope you'll remember that his friends will be very much disappointed if he is. He might make them so proud and happy that I guess he will, for he isn't half as thoughtless as he makes himself out,' 
said Polly, looking across at Tom with such friendly eyes that he was quite touched, though of course he didn't show it. Thank you, Polly. You may pull through, but I have my doubts. Now, old man, let us put along. It's getting late for the chicken he added, relapsing into the graceful diction with which a classical education gifts its fortunate possessor. Taking advantage of the moment while Will was wrestling with his boots in the closet, and Maud was absorbed in packing her apple into a large basket, Polly said to Tom in a low tone, "'Thank you very much for being so kind to Will.' "'Bless your heart. I haven't done anything. He's such a proud fellow he won't let me.' answered tom but you do in many little ways to-night for example do you think i don't know that the suit of clothes he just got would have cost a good deal more if your tailor hadn't made them he's only a boy and don't understand things yet but i know your way of helping proud people so that they don't find it out and i do thank you tom so much oh come polly that won't do what do you know about tailors and college matters said tom looking as much confused as if she had found him out in something reprehensible i don't know much and that's the reason why i'm grateful for your kindness to will i don't care what stories they tell about you i'm sure you won't lead him into trouble but keep him straight for my sake you know i've lost one brother and will takes jimmy's place to me now the tears in polly's eyes as she said that made tom vow a tremendous vow within himself to stand by will through thick and thin and keep him straight for polly's sake feeling all the time how ill-fitted he was for such a task i'll do my best he said heartily as he pressed the hand polly gave him with a look which assured her that he felt the appeal to his honor and that henceforth the country lad was safe from all the temptations tom could have offered him there now i shall give that to mamma to take her pills in it's just what she likes and it pleases her to be thought of said maud surveying her gift with complacency as she put on her things you're a good little soul to remember poor mum said tom with an approving nod well she was so pleased with the grapes you brought her i thought i'd try something and maybe she'd say thank you darling to me too do you think she will whispered maud with the wistful look so often seen on her little plain face see if she don't and to maud's great surprise tom didn't laugh at her project good night dear take care of yourself and keep your muffler round your mouth going over the bridge or you'll be as hoarse as a crow to-morrow said polly as she kissed her brother who returned it without looking as if he thought it girls nonsense then the three piled into the sleigh and drove off leaving polly nodding on the doorstep maud found the drive altogether too short but was consoled by the promise of a longer one if the sleighing lasted till next saturday and when tom ran up to bid his mother good-bye and give her a hint about maud's gift she stayed below to say at the last minute in unconscious imitation of polly good-night take care of yourself my dear tom laughed and was about to pinch the much enduring little nose but as if the words reminded him of something he gave her a kiss instead a piece of forbearance which almost took maud's breath away with surprise and gratification it was rather a silent drive for will obediently kept his muffler up and tom fell into a brown study he was not much given to reflection but occasionally indulged when something gave him a turn in that direction and at such times he was as sober and sincere as could be desired any one might have lectured him for an hour without doing as much good as that little call and the chat that grew out of it for though nothing very wise or witty was said many things were suggested and every one knows that persuasive influences are better than any amount of moralizing neither polly nor will tried to do anything of the sort and that was the charm of it nobody likes to be talked to but nobody can resist the eloquence of unconscious preaching with all his thoughtlessness 
tom was quick to see and feel these things and was not spoilt enough yet to laugh at them the sight of will and polly's simple affection for one another reminded him of a neglected duty so pleasantly that he could not forget it talking of early days made him wish he could go back and start again doing better grandma's name recalled the tender memory that always did him good and the thought that polly trusted her dearest brother to his care stirred up a manful desire to deserve the confidence tortures wouldn't have drawn a word of all this from him but it had its effect for boys don't leave their hearts and consciences behind them when they enter college and little things of this sort do much to keep both from being damaged by the four years scrimmage which begins the battle of life for most of them End of chapter 10